My guest needs no introduction to the supernatural because when he was four years of age, he started knowing things that no one had ever told him. For instance, tell me what happened at five. Sid, when I was five years of age, I had a dream about a next door neighbor. When I woke up from this dream, as a child, I was crying and very distraught over what I, what I had dreamed. My mother and father came in to see what was wrong with me. They began to comfort me. And as they were comforting me, they showed, looked outside and there was my friend that I'd seen in the dream playing. And I, I remember even to this day how confused I was over seeing my friend playing in the front yard. And yet I had just seen something terrible happen to him and his mother in this dream that I had. I had seen them involved in an automobile accident where my friend and his mother actually lost their lives. So you've just figured it was nothing. Well, a, when a I came dream, out of it, a yeah, bad dream. right. That's what my mom and dad, they convinced me that it was just a bad dream. See your friends out in the front yard playing. Yeah. Well, just a few days later that happened. Really? Yeah. So what'd your parents think? They, they didn't, at first didn't make the association of it, but then at, as, because they'd kind of forgotten about it, they had, they'd treated dreams as if it was a kind of an imagination, something that everybody has. But uh, after they realized that, that it had come true and they said, didn't, didn't John Paul have a dream about this or something along those lines, then they began to query me. And they, they, I grew up, they always thought that I had a vivid imagination. That's what they called it. You have such a vivid imagination. But when they saw, I mean, something like that, that would cause the, uh, the hair to stand up on end for it did. everyone. It did, but they thought it was, at that particular moment, they thought it was just one of those unusual occurrences. But uh, let me just take you back. Even your okay. birth was very unusual. Yes, well, it tell was. me about it. Well, my birth, my mother had lost a baby in a miscarriage and she was grieving over the loss of that child. She had an encounter with an angel who said, do not grieve over this child any longer. You're going so, to- well, Wait a now, <laughs> don't, don't slide that. <laughs> she had an encounter with an angel. Yes, she did. <laughs> my goodness. And, and so what did the angel say? It said, do not grieve over the loss of this child. You're gonna become pregnant again. You will have another, another child, it will be a son, and you are to call his name John Paul. And, but the pregnancy was a long one. It was a long one because, well, the angel went on to say that this child will have an 11th hour ministry and even your pregnancy will be a sign of that 11th hour ministry. So she became pregnant with me and the day that I was due, nine months later, 40 weeks, the gestation period, she went to the hospital in labor. And when she got to the hospital, everything was going along fine and then the labor process stopped. Well, when the labor process stopped, they sent her home thinking, well, it's just false labor pains. We'll see her within 24 to 48 hours. Instead, two months went by and two months to the day that I was to be born, uh, 11 months total, then she went back into the hospital and gave birth to me. Have you ever talked to a doctor to find out how unusual it is for it to last 11 months before you're born? Yeah, it was very, very, very rare. It's like less than two tenths of 1% of the children that would even survive that type of a birthing process. And in that, that particular day, they didn't have a means of artificially inducing mm -hmm. labor. So my mother would drink bottles of castor oil and she, we had a two-story house and she would sit mm -hmm. on the top of the stairs and bounce down the stairs after drinking bottles of castor oil trying to induce labor because she'd heard that it would throw the <laughs> uterus into contractions. It's a wonder she survived it's or you wonder. survived. But, but anyway, <laughs> over the years, you began to see that these were messages from God that were coming to pass. Yes. Uh, but you decided you wanted, to, you, you didn't like the life, the quote, religious life. No. You wanted to be a millionaire. You had been discipled right. of, by television like I was, <laughs> like most people were. And you can only be right. happy if you're a millionaire, but at age 30, your world turns upside down. You had a visitor. I did, I had a, visit, a visitor. I, I, my marriage was, and going, had a lot of difficulty in it. We had a small business, a daycare center that we owned. I was in, involved in a Fortune 500 company and was up, growing up in that Fortune 500 company, but everything seemed to be falling apart. My golden boys, quote, you know, that golden mm -hmm. boy status, seemed to be disappearing. And I thought, okay, if everything is going to disappear, then I am going to get, I'm, I'm going to get close to the living God. I'm gonna find him, I'm gonna find out what he's all about, and I'm gonna see if what happened to me when I was a child is real. And so I began seeking him. And he, at, on November, in November 1980, when I was th just had turned 30 years of age a few months before, I had an encounter where I was laying in, in bed. It was dark. Um, my wife had gone off to, to open up the daycare center. I had laryngitis, I couldn't speak, so I was staying home from work to try mm -hmm. to recover. 
in the dark of the morning, a light came into my room. And when this light came into my room, it started out small, it woke me up, and then it grew very quickly. It encompassed the entire room. Everything in the room disappeared, Sid. The dresser drawers disappeared, the chest drawer disappeared, the furniture disappeared, and the brightness of this light. Everything disappeared. I felt the holy presence, something holy, like I had never felt holiness. And I knew it was the presence of God. I rolled out of bed onto the floor because the bed was too high in the presence of the, in this holy presence. <laughs> if I could have gotten under the carpet, I would have. If I could have gotten under the foundation of the house, I would have because whatever it was, I was too high in the presence of this, of this holiness. And so in, the, in that, the, this light identified himself as the Lord. He identified himself as my creator. He identified himself as the one who had caused my birth to take place, caused my mother to conceive, told her about what was going to happen. He identified himself in all this, showed me my entire life, showed me why I had lived and not died, or actually why I had died twice, and he brought me back from these two death encounters. Uh, why uh, things that had happened to me had happened and what it was meant to do. The enemy meant to destroy me, but he meant it to create a sensitivity in me and an awareness of spiritual issues that he wanted me to tell the church about. Now, did he show you what would happen some things in the future? Yes, he did. He, took, he showed me some things that were going to take place and those things well, that were supposed to take place al- took what place. What does this 11th hour ministry mean? To me, it it is very akin to what Joel said in in the Bible. Joel said that in the last days, and I think that's like the 11th hour, midnight Mm -hmm. is typically thought of as being the conclusion of things. Um, And so the 11th hour would be in the wind down of things, as things are winding down. Listen, he knows what's going to happen in the future, in America, in the world. Be right back after this. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. Hello, YouTube, Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word. It means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe. Then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with John Paul Jackson. At age 30, he has a visitation from Jesus. Jesus walks in and says, this is amazing to me, John Paul. (laughs) He says to you, you will be alive in the final hour. What do you believe that means? I mean, I believe it means an account. There's a countdown that God has that only the Father knows. And in the, in the process of that countdown, there will be men and women who will herald and, and make uh, various signs, declare signs, declare wonders, make the church aware of various things that are going on. This is the Lord. This is why it's the Lord. And declare things that are going to happen before they happen. If you take a look at the prophecy of Joel, they would be even declare signs in the heavens, signs on earth, blood, fire, vapor, smoke, various kinds of signs and wonders that prophetic people those who know the end before it happens see things that, as, as, that are not as though they were and declare them and they come to pass. Uh, you know what I find fascinating? I had dinner with John Paul Jackson and a few other friends of mine, and there was a prophet present mm. from a foreign country that knew nothing about John Paul Jackson. And uh, I was about ready to give a little introduction to the group as that John Paul Jackson is a prophet and that he really has a gifting to understand dreams and to help other people understand supernaturally their dreams. Uh, But my wife said, no, no, let's order first before you tell everyone. I said, okay, Joy. And so we ordered first. And then this person to my right uh, stood up and you tell me, he, no, oh, I heard him say, I heard him say that you were a prophet. Yes. I heard him I say you specialize in dreams yes. and then a number of other things, but it must be so strong. I mean, were you kind of taken aback that this stranger read your mail? I loved it. <laughs> I called my wife and she said, now you know how other people feel when you come into the room and tell them. Because I was so, it was such a wonderful thing that happened. What happened, Sid, is this. In God, who is eternal, sees outside of time. 
and he sees what is going to happen to you. And he will send various men and women to you or angels to you, or he will speak to you. He will appear to you. He makes himself known to you to help you achieve the purpose for which he put you here on earth. And every one of us have a purpose that God put us here on earth, things that we are to accomplish. Acts chapter two in the Bible tells us some, a very interesting thing, a strange thing that is written there. It says this, that from one blood, God put people on the face of the earth and determined the exact time they should be born, determined mm -hmm. the exact place they should live. He has a purpose for every single one of us. Many people who are watching us today don't know that they have a purpose. They feel like, I must have blown it, something must have happened. You know, my family wouldn't have anything good happen to it. And the reality is the Lord God knew that they would be here and he put them here for a purpose yet to be fulfilled. And they've got something wonderful that they can do. And the Lord wants to talk to them. God wants to make himself known to them. Yeah, but there, there, there are people that are watching us right now and they say, okay, we watch it supernatural. We see Sid, we see Sid's guests. We see that they really hear from God. We, we believe they were sincere, but no angels ever come to me. What would you say to them? I would say that, you know what? Many people have had angelic experiences in dreams, but they don't know it because angels can come to you in two ways in a dream. They can come to you cloaked, the Bible talks about them being veiled, and they come to you in the full glory of heaven. And when that happens, you fall down at their feet as a dead man in the full glory of heaven. But when they come veiled, you can ask them to dinner, like Abraham fed the angel of the Lord and two other angels with this theophany, fed them and asked them, if they, uh, asked them what the future was going to hold, what was going to happen, and they told him about Sodom and Gomorrah. So he didn't fall at their feet as a dead man, he entertained them. And we are told in scripture that we can actually entertain angels without even knowing we're entertaining them. They can be there with us, we can talk to them, we can have encounters with them, but that's when they come in a veiled format. How, how did you realize that not only do you understand the supernatural language of dreams mm -hmm. for yourself, but you can help others? How did you come to this understanding? I had some remarkable encounters that, that the Lord just said, I'm going to help you. <laughs> I think it's one of those things where it takes Listen, weak things when, to confound the wise. When it comes to dreams, <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> me too. What, what the Lord did, he began to take me through dreams and scripture. And he would even give me dreams to explain scriptural dreams. The symbolism in the scripture, the what I call a divine logic, a logic that is higher than human logic. But when you get it, it makes so much sense. Why, why does he want people to understand their dreams? Everyone dreams. Yes. Why does he want us to understand it? Because it's a major way of him communicating to us. Dreams, we spend one third of our life asleep. We spend one third of our life dreaming. By the time I'm 60, I'm 56 years right now, by the time I'm 60, I will have slept 20 years. In those 20 years, how much could God speak in that time? Well, what he does, he uses dreams to bypass our rational mind. And so he tells us things in symbolic form, that we now interpret, and with that interpretation, we come to a new understanding of what God wants us to do. The great thing about it is he gives us the symbolism. He helps us understand the symbols. Now, he may bring somebody along to help us, but he may give the interpretation in the dream. As we're having it, he may unfold the interpretation right then and there. But you have a supernatural gift to do this. This isn't a natural thing. Yes, but that, well, I think that's why the Lord wanted me to be kind of a forerunner, to teach people things that are, should be common to them because the church has discounted because we're taking on a Greek mindset, an Aristotelian mindset, instead of a Hebraic mindset, we, we think if it's not logical and it's not tangible, then it's irrelevant to our life. So our Western culture has diminished the value of dreams and God wants to reestablish his communication process. I processes. believe God wants to speak to you through your dreams, but I am so fascinated by the things that John Paul Jackson knew that came to pass before he knew them before they came to pass and the things that God's shown him for the future. We'll be right back after this word, but you actually saw people become president of the United States before have, it yes. happened. Yeah. We'll be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. 
Hello, Sid Roth here with John Paul Jackson, and I am so excited to be with you at this moment. I and I'm excited to be with you at this moment. I believe that this is, it's a Hebrew word, it's beshert. It, it, it's destiny, it's meant to be. Uh, let's whet their appetite a little bit. Okay. Tell me a few things that God showed you before the fact. Uh, let's go into the presidential uh, uh, elections. Tell me a, something he told you about a president before it happened. He told me that Ronald Reagan would become president. And in fact, Ronald Reagan came to me in a dream and visited me and told me that he would become president. My goodness. <laughs> uh, tell me something else, maybe uh, 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 with our satellite rocket system. Well, he, talk, he talked about the, the things that were going to be happening as far as small nuclear warheads being able to be put onto a very small missile. So you, it, it was previously thought that it had to be the size of uh, an automobile, a nuclear warhead had right. to be the size of an automobile, but he told me that the day would come when they would put nuclear warheads on small rockets that would be able to go anywhere from 500 to 1,000 miles. It would be a small rocket, but it would still carry a nuclear warhead. How long ago did he tell that you that? That was 1980. 1980 he began to tell me My that. My goodness, you can get in trouble if you talk about things like this before it's released oh, to I the did. general public. I, I, I did some programs like this on television and I had people writing me in saying this is a false prophet because I have an uncle who's in this nuclear program and he tells me it's the size of an automobile and, and so on. And so yeah, I had a lot of, lot of uh, things that happened like that that people said I was a false prophet because of it. But now we know that it, it's come to pass, it's true. If you could get the ear of President Bush, mm -hmm. what would you tell him based on what you know? I would tell him to, uh, I would ask him to reconsider his, the ideas of giving land away in Israel. I would ask him to reconsider uh, how he is going about the Middle East process and has gone about it, that there's a way to gain, to gain uh, uh, what he wants to have happen without all the things that we're going through right now. Have you got any insight at all as to what's happening in the land of Israel at this moment and what's going to happen in the near future? Things are going to get worse in, in Israel. Then there's going to be the, the things that happen right now were basically used to defuse the, the attention from Iran and what's going on with this nuclear program there. At the same time, Israel suddenly recognized that these, this armament that was being built up by the Hezbollah was being put there as an offensive weapon, not as a defensive weapon. That Hezbollah was now trying to make it name for itself above Al Qaeda and above Hamas. And so there was some jealousy and tension between the, those three uh, Islamic groups. And that, that jealousy is going to continue. And in fact, it now is continuing because there's now infighting amongst various groups, even Hamas and a new group trying to, to come up. Uh, I, would, I would also uh, say that if Israel, um, in this next prime minister, there's another prime minister coming quickly. Do you know who this prime minister is? Um, I'm not supposed to tell you. I'm not, I'm not trying to be evasive. I know who it is, but I'll I'm leave that I'm not trying to be too. evasive. <laughs> uh, there are, somebody's probably supposed to release that. I cannot release that. And again, I'm not supposed to, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm just trying to be obedient. But, but with the next prime minister, there is, there is an opportunity for Israel to really gain some ground. And I believe that if the, the people in America will pray, seek God, that he will send divine answers and divine solutions to the enigmas that currently seem to be facing, daunting enigmas that seem to be facing Israel right now. Tell me about a dream that you had that came to pass, what it meant and, and what, what occurred. Well, one that comes to my mind immediately, that was when I, I left the, the secular world, the corporate world, and went in, into uh, more of a religious setting. What happened it was that I had a dream where I was kicked out of an airplane and my boss was kicked out of an airplane. And uh, when I was kicked out of the airplane, my parachute wouldn't open and I tried to open it and I, I pulled the ripcord off and then pulled the second ripcord off, the, the emergency chute, pulled them off. And uh, only as you can do in a dream, I left my body 
went down to check out where I was going to land, found out I was going to land uh, on the land, and I knew that I could bend this time-space continuum. I know things in dreams are strange, okay. but that's why they're metaphorical. You can bend this time-space continuum. If you run fast enough, you can land in the water and not on the land. So my spirit, so to speak, ran out to the water. My body came down and I, and I hit the water. And then when I uh, came up out of the water, after I thought I was going to drown because I went so deep, I heard a voice and a voice spoke to me and says, when you come up, I will have equipped you to minister to various people and various people groups. And I will uh, open up doors for you, but you're going to lose your job and you're going to try to do two different things. Remember, two different shoots. One was a regular shoot, one was the emergency shoot. You're going to try to try to do two different things, but neither one of those are going to work. You're going to realize that you had to fall into the water. I am that water. I am the fountain of living water. And, and you know, metaphorically speaking, and I will give you life. And when you come up out of this, you will have, be equipped to minister to people who need to know more about me. And that happened three days later. Three days later, my, my boss made a play to become a vice president of the company. He lost that play. He was removed, and 24 hours later, I was removed because I was the man right underneath him in charge of everything. Uh, you know, John Paul Jackson, my staff went through your uh, CD on mm -hmm. dreams where mm -hmm. you teach people on this, right. and all of a sudden they started having dreams that were very, very significant. Is this an unusual report or does this happen often? No, there's an anointing that, that happens. And, and Saul, when he met the prophets, he began to prophesy. There's, a, there's something that happens with the Lord who he gives gifts to people. When you come in contact with people who have those gifts, then you end up doing the very things that those people do. So if they have a dream gift, then you end up dreaming. If you have a prophetic gift, you end up having prophetic things, a revelation that you didn't know you were going to have, understanding about things you didn't know. You just gave me an idea. Would you pray for an impartation of the anointing that's on you to be on the people to understand dreams? I would love to. Do that now. I would love to. Abba Yehovah, in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Ben Eli, I ask you to give understanding and insight and revelation to people who don't yet have it or to those who don't remember it or to those that you want to move into greater understanding of the way you speak, the eternality, how you are eternal, always have been, always will be, and are at this moment. I ask you, Father, to show them what they need to do in order to walk into the purpose for which they were created. I ask you to open their minds because your word says in Job that you speak in many ways and man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, while men slumber upon their beds, you open the minds of men and seal their instructions. Father, I ask you to open the minds of the people that are listening right now and seal their instructions so that they can walk into a greater knowledge of you and have impact upon the people that you desire them to touch. For your great name's sake, I ask. Amen. I, I believe there was a transfer of a very special presence of God for you to have dreams, remember dreams, and understand dreams, and then it's up to you to be obedient. By the way, would you be shocked if the next prime minister is Netanyahu in Israel? Probably not. <laughs> Uh-oh, I think I got something. Anyway, Jeremiah 3131, you want a word from God? That's from God. That's for you. Behold, the days come in which I shall make a new covenant a blood covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their forefathers, which they violated, but this new covenant will do two things. One, God says, I will remember your sins no more. You will be clean and there'll be nothing separating you from God. And two, you will know God. Isn't that what you want? There's no other name given unto man in which we must have this new covenant, but the name Yeshua, Jesus. Jesus is the way to God, the only.